Welcome to this uh, course on issues in biotics. Uh, this is a module 1 and unit 5, where we will discuss uh, bioethics today, culture, democracy and law. So, this is in a sense a lecture which concludes the introduction to this course, which also try to understand how modern bioethics appears in different societies, different cultural backgrounds, particularly with reference to India and several other developing countries where cultures are very strong or rather communities are very strong and in that sense the nature of moral uh, theories, the nature of moral ethical frameworks are different from that of the European context. So, we will discuss the nature of major problems facing contemporary bioethics in that sense today, particularly as I mentioned with reference to other civilizations and cultures. When you consider other civilizations and cultures, the priorities will be different. And there are several difficulties we encounter in this context. So, that will be addressed a little bit. Then cultural and other differences to which modern day bioethics has to be sensitive towards the nature of ethical deliberations factors to be taken into account. So, in this context we should be adopting a very different model of ethical deliberations to arrive at solutions to ethical problems. So, I would call it a phronetic approach in bioethics. So, we will conclude this lecture with a note on what I mean by a phronetic approach in bioethics. So, now let us uh, discuss the nature of problems that modern bioethics encounter in different cultures. So, we have most bioethical issues, we have already seen this when we have discussed some of the important problems and issues that emerge. They involve a host of problems like uh, economic, social, cultural, legal and scientific. Without really considering these different aspects that uh, create a situation, we will not be able to understand and evaluate the real problem and also try to find reasonable solutions to this problem. So, when you consider the problems, we have to take into account all these factors. Again, uh, this also points to the difficulties in arriving at a global bioethics, because uh, if you consider the idea, the notion of global bioethics as a set of norms and standards, which would probably guide uh, practice of medicine across cultures and civilizations or rather across different countries, then uh, it is very difficult to arrive at one set of such principles or one set of such norms and protocols, because different cultures have different practices and customs and beliefs and it is very difficult to apply a set of universal norms in the same way in these different civilizations. So, it is in this context I would say that we can think of a phronetic approach. I will discuss about it slightly later. Again differences in the nature of uh, problems, uh, the ethical problems that arise in different countries like developed countries and developing and underdeveloped countries are going to be very different. The priorities will be very different in these countries. We know that in India the major concern is one of the major concerns is access to medical care, because many people do not have access to medical care they will have to walk several kilometers to reach the nearest healthcare center and to access uh, healthcare. This may not be a situation in a developed country. So, we have to adopt a different approach definitely in our uh, culture. Again central uh, moral concerns also differ, this is what I mentioned, because uh, more important concerns in, in cultures like or in countries like ours will be. Uh, issues related to the question of justice, where uh, the access and uh, many other issues related to that, justice is a major concern in uh, bioethics. Uh, while in many developed countries, the individual autonomy is uh, one of the fundamental concerns. This is not to say that individual autonomy is not a concern in our country or in uh, developing countries. Individual autonomy is very important in these countries as well because modern medicine demands that uh, the individual needs to be protected in a certain manner. The rights of the individuals need to be protected, no doubt about it, but at the same time priorities might change. So, we will just see one uh, recent news item which has appeared in one of the uh, newspapers. It says that over 20 
percent of Dalit children are not immunized in rural uh, Gujarat. This is a study conducted by uh, US based organization East West Management Institute. It says that over 20 percent of Dalit children are not immunized in uh, rural Gujarat. This shows that how caste plays an important role here in our country, in our culture. And uh, we cannot avoid considering this uh, factors like this in our country when we talk about ethics. This directly refers to a problem injustice because injustice has been done accessibility due to several social factors like caste, religion, uh, financial background, gender. These are several such issues which are relevant in countries like ours, which may not be the case in a developing country. In a developed country. So, naturally the priorities are different, culture has a role in uh, determining the rightness and wrongness of an action. So, this uh, again points to the fact of relativism which we will be discussing a little bit uh, in detail in uh, some of the coming lectures. But of course, relativism is not just a theoretical possibility, it is an actuality. Different cultures have different views about what is right and what is wrong. And this needs to be taken into account when we deliberate upon ethical issues and find solutions. So, this also calls for a very different approach in bioethics. So, these are all challenges posed towards developing a global bioethics, which is uh, which, which has certain norms which are universal. Again, issues like uh, privacy and confidentiality, which uh, are very important in developed societies, but are not even thought of as priorities in many developing and underdeveloped countries. See for instance, if you go to a typical government hospital in rural India, if you go to a maternity ward or a gynecology ward, you will see women lined up to have a consultation with the physician. The doctor, the gynecologist will be sitting there and uh, in her room and many patients will be standing there in a queue to have a consultation with her and along with women there will be their husbands as well. So, everyone is listening to everyone else. There is no question of confidentiality, patient confidentiality. We cannot implement practically implement uh, this ethical norm which is of course, very important. But unfortunately, because of social situations, this is not the priority here. The priority is care, health care. The priority is whether the physician, the gynecologist is able to provide the required care for the women uh, who have lined up uh, there. That is more important. And again, when you talk about cultural differences, most of the theoretical frameworks we talk about or we consider to understand uh, an ethical problem in uh, the context of uh, medical practice. These ethical frameworks we find that they are products of enlightenment Europe. See, let us take for example, uh, the two important approaches deontologism and utilitarianism, which we will be discussing later uh, in detail. See, both of these approaches have uh, originated somewhere around 17, 18 and 19 centuries in Europe and they are typical, typical European uh, frameworks. Again, the four principle approach which is so prevalent today, the principalist approach which is advocated by Thomas Bucham and others. This is also, I mean this, this approach of course, has some universal appeal because it talks about four very important ethical principles to be adopted by all physicians. They are not ethical frameworks, but rather they are, uh, this approach is not an ethical framework. It's, it talks about fundamental principles which cannot be violated which cannot be neglected when you practice medicine. Principles like autonomy, beneficence, non beneficence and justice. But even then, we can find that these principles are fundamentally individual centric. Though there are uh, principles like uh, no harm theory and uh, justice, they are all also emphasized by the principalist approach. But somewhere when you go along you feel that you know a little more importance is given to individual autonomy and individual centric they have become. And uh, so, naturally the emphasis is on uh, individual autonomy and rights, which I have already mentioned and I reassert is extremely important in today's context. We will discuss that, because we cannot neglect the importance of individual rights in today's context of uh, the practice of modern medicine. Since we are talking about uh, uh, ethical frameworks, 
one of the important, very important ethical uh, framework is developed by Immanuel Kant, which is one of the important deontological theories, which we will be discussing later, which talks about uh, duty, the word deont means duty. So, it emphasizes on duty, but Kantian duty is of a very different kind. It says that duty uh, implies or duty emphasizes on a can, but uh, it says that one ought to do one's duty, but at the same time an ought implies a can. So, he or she, the person who performs the action ought to do the right thing because he or she can do it. There is some sort of an individual freedom, which is a recognition of an agency, the individual agent who is free from all other factors, social, political, economic, all other factors. The individual is capable of thinking independent of all the factors that might influence him. He or she is capable of using that reason, that universal reason uh, which is there. And uh, such an individual, such a model of an individual is uh, very difficult to find in rural India, even today. I mean, this is not to underestimate people from rural India, because I do not mean that this is an incapability. There is a lot of strength to be part of, uh, in being part of societies and communities also. But at the same time, we have to strike the right balance by being part of a family, by being part of a society and a community. We should also be able to take independent decisions as independent individuals. And this is the requirement, this is the necessity of our times. And modern medicine demands that, because otherwise there will be gross injustice done to us. Now, again, uh, since we are talking about cultural differences, again, you know, the different frameworks of ethics developed in different cultures like the Buddhist and Hindu bioethics. They emphasize more on community and on humanity to some extent, because Buddhism for example, consider the essential oneness of oneself and nature or the rest of the world. And even in Hinduism, the broad ethical perspective of Hinduism, when we talk about Vasudeva Kudumbagam and all kinds of things, they also sort of uh, point to some sort of a unity of entire humanity or entire living creatures. So, there is a conception that the entire world is a community, a one unit with integral parts, not recognizing the individuality, the uniqueness and the independence of individual units. Again, roles of individuals has in the social hall determined identities in these societies, because we have already uh, seen this, you know, the idea of dharma, when we have discussed uh, the ancient Indian bioethics which emphasizes this concept of dharma. Dharma is often associated with a role an individual play in a particular society. So, it is role based and uh, the social hall is very important here, because what role that individual plays in that society is important here, that de determines his dharma. Now, the attempt is to arrive at a balance, as I already mentioned between the individual and collective welfare uh, by often sacrificing the former. So, even this was a concern even for the ancient societies that you have to arrive at some sort of a balance between oneself and the society, one's own welfare and the welfare of the society. And the concept of dharma in the Indian context is largely uh, used for this purpose. But often it happens that when you try to strike a right balance, it becomes very difficult you may have to sacrifice yourself, the individual for the sake of the collective whole, collective welfare. And the stresses on duty for collective welfare, obligations and responsibilities are more important than rights. So, rights of the individual become important only when you are able to treat and consider the individual as an independent unit. It has got this conception has got its advantages and disadvantages, which we will discuss uh, later. Now, given all these facts, we will also have to see the present context of modern medicine as it is practiced in different societies and different cultures. We all know that modern medicine is a highly complex science and as a science, it presupposes certain universal premises, certain universal principles 
and it is followed in different cultures and different civilizations in the same manner. As far as the scientific aspect of medicine is concerned, the diagnostic methods are concerned, more or less the same principles are employed, the scientific principles are almost the same. Only the way in which it is practiced is different in different cultures. Now, in the beginning of this uh, lecture, I have mentioned that the practicing of medicine involves certain interest, uh, various interests like economic interest, social, political, etcetera. All these are part of that entire, you know, uh, process, a social activity we called, we call practicing of medicine. There are economic factors, social factors, political factors, cultural factors, religious factors, all these factors play very important role, though we are practicing a science which is a universal science, which is based on universal premises. On at the same time, we all know that though it is a universal science, the practice of this science, the practice of medicine is a highly regulated domain. There are regulations. Uh, internal as well as external, medical bodies regulate themselves. There are several medical bodies which we have mentioned in the previous uh, lecture that they regulate themselves, they have uh, prescribed, they have come up with certain regulations, certain norms and standards which physicians and other healthcare professionals have to uh, follow when they practice medicine. At the same time, there are uh, external governmental regulations they have to follow. So, in one sense, the autonomy which uh, medical professional communities employ are to some extent limited. And there are of course, the protocols, the norms, legal guidelines and policy statements of hospitals, of uh, societies, of countries which are legally binding to some extent. So, in this context, we will see what are the major impetus for change in uh, our society. When we see medicine in our society or society like ours, countries like ours, which are not uh, countries where modern medicine has actually emerged. Modern medicine is the product of European enlightenment. So, this has come to civilization like or countries like ours through various processes and now we have a decent medical institution in our country. But the practice of this medicine demands that we have to see it in a very different light. We cannot, we can no longer remain as a ancient society which values traditional moral prescriptions. We have to change our value perceptions of course. See uh, for instance, I sometime back I mentioned about the concept of autonomy, which is so central in the principalistic approach and in the practice of modern medicine in many developed countries. The individual patient is treated as the authority to take decisions, the final decision has to be taken by him or her. Because the individual is considered as a person who has the ability to take decision which is good for him. He is an agent, he or she is an agent, a moral agent who knows better than others what is good for him or her. So, this is a presupposition of enlightenment Europe, which I sometime back mentioned about Immanuel Kant's ethical theory, deontologism or any such ethical frameworks presuppose such a concept, particularly Kantian theory that the categorical imperative which Kant talks about assumes that there is an individual who can take independent decisions an oath implies a can, I repeat. But to say that these are all western and uh, to argue that since they are all western, they are irrelevant in our country, in our culture, in our civilization is uh, not the right attitude, because we have society has changed a lot. We have already undergone several decades of democratization, our society has undergone a lot of changes and democratization is uh, a very important part in that, uh, we have become a democracy. We are no longer those ancient societies what India was some time back. So, we have formulated a constitution with specification of fundamental rights and now we conduct our country, we rule our country on the basis of a very modern constitution 
which emphasizes the so-called enlightenment values and most of us have come to agree that these values are very important as far as India as a modern country is concerned. We cannot do away with them. So, in that context the constitution ensures that there are certain very important rights. The constitution recognizes the value of the individual, value of a liberal free individual. Though at the same time the constitution and knows that and recognizes that the individual is part of certain community and all that, but more important is individual rights. Wherever on occasions where human rights are violated, the courts will step in and try to protect the individual from communities and societies and other individuals and institutions. So, this is very important and this is a very important feature of democratization process which is not the case in other countries. Say for example, in Pakistan this may not be the case because they still remain more or less as a theocratic society where one particular religion and its uh, principles are considered as very important and most many of these principles are not really modern they have originated several decades or several centuries back. But most of the principles which we consider in our constitution as valuable are modern, they are rational, they are based on rational and they are open to rational deliberations and critical evaluations. This process of democratization is a very important feature, very important phenomenon uh, we have to take into account when we deliberate upon modern day bioethics in our country. Again the formulation of government policies with public health initiatives, many of uh, the government policies if we examine the whole history of health policy in India, we could see that there is a definite aim, many of these policies are aimed at some sort of doing justice to society, doing justice to certain, certain communities and sections of people in the society. So, to provide them better access, to provide them better uh, quality and uh, many other things are uh, part of our policy deliberations. And they also value the modern values, the modern theoretical frameworks. Then another very important feature of our society is the active involvement of judiciary which is very striking, which is very important as far as uh, a country like India is concerned and which is also which also contributes heavily to the democratization process that still happens in our society. Judiciary plays a very important role and judiciary's role is uh, largely confined to the interpretation of law and the law is actually provided by the constitution and the constitution I already mentioned is based on certain values which are modern, which are rational, which are not theocratic. So, in that way the active involvement of judiciary is very important and then another one is media. Media plays a very influential role in uh, the public perception and understanding and deliberation of ethical issues. Many issues in, uh, recent, in the recent past if you examine, many ethical issues have been discussed by the media, by experts in the media and uh, this has helped a lot to significantly shape the perception of the public about ethical uh, issues. Say let us take one example, a classic example is the Aruna Schoenbach case which has happened some time back and uh, in this case what has happened was the contribution of judiciary to an ethical discourse is phenomenal. So that is the reason why I am taking up this case here because this is one case which has gone to the court and the apex court has taken a decision and come up with a verdict which is hailed as a balanced verdict. So, what has happened was uh, it is interpreting and clarifying the legal aspects, the court has come up with a, a very clear interpretation of certain legal provisions that are available in cases like this and it, but at the same time what is more important about this case is that it is quite unprecedented in that way. What is very important is that it initiated the Aruna Schoenbach case initiated a larger discourse in the public domain which involved the scientific community because the doctors and also pharmacists and many other scientific science pe people of science were involved in this. The Supreme Court actually took all their inputs and help 
uh, then the physicians, uh, nurses, they also were very much part, you know nurses are the caregivers and they were looking after Aruna for decades. So, their contribution, their inputs were also very important uh, and treated as so by the Supreme Court. Then the hospital administration where uh, the, the hospital in which Aruna was admitted and she was, she spent her uh, uh, last days or rather the last few decades in her life. Social activists, public intellectuals, ethicists, media and finally and most importantly the judiciary. So, you could see that this Aruna case is so landmark case in, in the whole history of Indian bioethics and Indian judiciary because it involved inputs or contributions from uh, several walks of life, several stakeholders, everyone like uh, scientists, activists, everyone was involved in this process and contributed to the ethical deliberations and discourse that was happening. And uh, this is Aruna, one is her old photograph and the other one is uh, towards almost towards the time of her death. And the story has uh, which everyone knows after being sodomized while uh, being strangled with a dog chain in 1973, she was largely brain dead. So, these are certain scientific facts which we have to underline. She was largely brain dead, cortically blind, unable to speak or walk or have control over body movements. So, the question is that whether we can to what extent we can consider Aruna as a person as a person so that you know you have to respect the, the rights of a person and who takes decisions because Aruna is incapable of taking any decision and she is brain dead. If you if a person is brain dead that is almost equivalent as considering as dead. Then again according to medical report she is in a permanent vegetative state that is another very interesting and very important input in this case. So, all these are considered by the court. When a social activist named Pinky Virani approached the Supreme Court with a plea to euthanize Aruna, which is again very unprecedented in India, because India, Indian law does not allow euthanasia, active euthanasia, where the patient is uh, being assisted by the physicians to end his or her life. But here the uh, social activist uh, Pinky Virani has approached the court with precisely that request. And the nurses at uh, the hospital King Edward Memorial Hospital in Mumbai who were uh, caring for Aruna opposed this plea and there was this whole argument. The court reviewing the stellar care given at KEM by the nurses stated that the nurses were the next friend of Aruna. This is a very interesting observation. So, the next friend since Aruna has no agency. since Aruna is not in a position to take decisions for herself. It is the next friend who can take decisions for her and it is not activists like Pinky Virani who are Aruna's next friend, but the nurses who are carrying Aruna for the several decades. And now we can see that uh, there are several questions raised and clarified by Supreme Court verdict. Like for example, when can one say that a person is brain dead and in a permanent vegetative state? This is a clear scientific question. Again, what are the rights of such a person, which is an ethical and legal issue? What are the responsibilities of the care providers and the state when a person is declared to be in a permanent vegetative state? Again, raises several social issues as well as ethical issues. The apex court provided clear guidelines on each question. So, that is what makes this case landmark. Again, it suggested that the need for collective deliberation, this case actually points to the need for a collective deliberations involving different stakeholders to arrive at clear and correct. See, here uh, we can see that the apex court has not unilaterally decided uh, or come up with a final verdict. It has taken into account the inputs provided by all these stakeholders. So, this fact makes the Aruna case quite interesting and relevant. Now, it uh, also suggests that we need to come up with new models of trust, relationships, protocols and contracts in our society. Because as I already mentioned, we are now trying to apply certain norms 
which have originated certain ethical norms and standards and principles which do not have their conceptual roots in our history. They have originated somewhere else, but for certain historical reasons they have become now important in our context as well. And this demand certain considerations or rather reconsider, we need to reconsider certain existing models, the validity of certain existing models in our society like the models of trust between physician and patient or rather in our traditionally in our society uh, we believe that the physicians are trusted by the patients. There is an unquestionable trust, but we now realize that this is no longer valid. Again relationship between patient, physician, family members, others they have all undergone change and we have to come up with very clear protocols to guide, to uh, regulate uh, procedures and also decisions and actions taken by physicians and other healthcare professionals. So, we need to arrive at a better clarity on roles, obligations and rights and this situation definitely raises a host of issues. So, now uh, let us see, uh, let us try to conclude with uh, a larger picture. So, when we try to situate modern bioethics in our country, in society like ours, in non-western, non-European societies, we are now encountering a host of problems because there are problems related to pollution, poverty, war, terrorism and many other issues which are socio-political and economical in nature. So, we have to consider all these factors when we try to deliberate upon bioethical issues and bioethical solutions. Industrialization of course, is another very important uh, problem. Globalization of healthcare practices and procedures calls for certain common guidelines and norms. This I have already mentioned. On the one hand, we have differences, we are culturally different, we are uh, politically different, we are socially different, we are economically different. At the same time, there needs to be some commonality, some common frameworks we have to agree upon. See for instance, nobody can deny the importance of confidentiality, whether we are able to you know allow or rather afford to have confidentiality is a different question, privacy, autonomy decision making rights, nobody can deny the value of these uh, concepts in today's world because uh, medicine is no longer those days uh, ancient practices, healing practices, it has become a complex scientific technological activity. So, we need to assert, we need to be sensitive to the rights of the individual and protect, try to protect them. So, we have to arrive at some common guidelines and again on the other hand we have to deal with uh, issues related to the question of social justice and uh, tackle the newly emerging technologies and the host of the kind of problems, ethical issues they raise and threats to the individual and personhood and many other issues, right of patients, uh, decision making process, the roles patients have in the decision making process, the possibility of exploitation and harm, all these aspects have to be taken into account when we try to situate or when you try to understand what role modern biomedical med ethics has in our societies and patient autonomy of course. It will be interesting to see how the individual is situated in uh, this context, even in our society, even in countries like ours, how the individual is situated. The model of social self becomes often inadequate because I refer to this concept of social self because many of our societies, many of the societies which are rooted in communities which still value community morality, the social self is more or less important than the individual self. But the model of social self is becoming increasingly inadequate in today's world with the breaking down of traditional family system, joint family system that itself is a major change initiated a major change. Now, we have nuclear families and nuclear families will have very limited space, very confined space, iso insulated space in which individuals have a possibility and ability to grow as individuals, not as collective groups or social selves.
So, technological and scientific situations offer more opportunities. Now, on the one hand there are certain positive opportunities these technologies offer to this uh, in our societies like to lead a better life, to be more independent. The technology helps us to be more and more independent, to take independent decisions uh, and all that and also new forms of exploitation. So, on the other hand the darker side of this technology is that it also leaves a lot of room for exploitation, physicians and uh, healthcare, other healthcare professionals, even hospital administration, industries, all possibilities of exploitation are also available. Just to clarify this point which I have discussed, I will uh, take a case of a living kidney donation case which is from the book which I have uh, given uh, details here. Uh, the case happens in a particular ethnic background. Mr. A B 57 years, an Arab citizen and father of three children, two sons, one is 22 years old, a student and another one is 27 years, a married man and a daughter who is 32 years old, but unmarried. He has uh, acute chronic renal failure and all the three children were found to serve as potential kidney donors. Now, the youngest son was diagnosed as the most resilient uh, for this. Family's choice that is very interesting is the 32 year old daughter who is unmarried. So, this is a very typical situation. The youngest son with 22 years old is being diagnosed as the most resilient for this, but the family's choice is a 32 year old uh, woman. According to their ethnic background, the unmarried female has an inferior family status. So, obviously that is the reason for the family choice. Now, psychological counseling found that the right to refuse had not been considered by the family. This woman had the right to refuse, but that has not been considered. Now, what is what can we do on such situation? How does the modern bioethical deliberation approach this case and what would be the solution? It is a complex issue. I am not here to provide a solution to the problem. I have just presented an issue just to show that how complex situations are in different cultures, whether to respect the family's decision, which is very important in civilizations and cultures like this. It is very important. Or we should respect the woman, the right of the woman to refuse, which is again very important because such a problem has occurred because of the technology which modern medicine has introduced. So, it is a modern context that makes things much and much complicated like this. So, naturally we need to respect or we need to also consider the ethical values which a modern society advocate which emphasizes on individual rights, autonomy and all that. So, it is a very complex situation. I am not trying to arrive at a clear cut solution to concrete issues like this which we come upon or which we encounter in our societies. My only suggestion is that as I mentioned when I discussed uh, Aruna's case that it calls for deliberations. It calls for very detailed deliberation from different works of life, different stakeholders involved, the inputs of scientific community, the inputs of other professional societies, the input of inputs of legal experts of uh, various other people have to be sought and of course, media has to take it up and discuss it. So, that we can arrive at some sort of an understanding, a common understanding uh, which will help us to or rather which will guide us to the right decision. What we have arrived at is a realization that there is only a very limited scope for a universal bioethics, because cultural differences cannot be neglected. But at the same time modern medicine is not philanthropic and not a charity affair. This also we have to keep in mind. Modern medicine is highly backed by industrial interest, profit maximization interest and various other uh, you know power structures are sponsoring it. So, we have to be very careful and in this context the individual is the more vulnerable, the most vulnerable entity is the individual. So, there is a need 
to come up and protect the individual. So, that also cannot be avoided. Corporatization and technologization are also rampant in uh, the so called non European societies. So, we cannot say that these issues will not figure in, in our societies or in non European societies, because they are also undergoing what we broadly call as the modernization process. And this technologization or corporatization offers possibilities to patients and also more situations where they may be exploited. So, there are two sides of the coin which I have already emphasized. There is on the one hand the positive the possibilities and on the other hand the, the, the negative possibilities of exploitation and coercion. So, the principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice which we have mentioned today modern bioethics consider as very important principles. They are not totally irrelevant in, in other societies considering modern medicines ability to coerce, be coercive. So, this is very important. The only thing is that these principles have to be adapted culturally and this cultural adaptation process is not a very simple process. For that we need high level deliberations, we need a lot of deliberations, lot of discussions and this ethical discourse has to develop in society like ours. And we need to aim at or aim towards a phronetic approach, a phronetic means you know the emphasis the term phronesis is used by Aristotle and Greek tradition to highlight the, the difference of ethical uh, knowledge which is, which is not which is practical wisdom. The ethical knowledge is practical wisdom which is different from technical knowledge or uh, other kinds of theoretical knowledge which is not a purely theoretical knowledge. Ethical knowledge is not theoretical purely, it is practical wisdom. So, one needs to know that there are certain universal norms and the validity of the universal norms have to be accepted. But one needs to know how these universal norms can be applied to concrete context, which are culturally and uh, politically, economically determined and decided. So, this should be the kind of an ideal which we are looking towards. So, this with this lecture I am winding up the introductory part of my lecture series. From the next lecture onwards we will try to see the theoretical frameworks that have shaped the very nature of ethical deliberations in bioethics. For the time being we will wind up now, thank you.